Hello, welcome to the, the briefing session to highlight the best of ESL ILC 12, 2017 on metabolic liver disease. We'll deal with non-alcoholic metabolic liver disease and we have Elisabetta Bujanesi for the University of Torino in Italy that is an expert in NAFLD and myself, Ramon Batayer, that I am from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I'm an expert in alcoholic liver disease. And after this presentation, we welcome you to go to the liver tree to have further information for the presentation. We will start with uh, the briefing of the best of presentation on NAFLD and Please, Elisabetta, go ahead and give us some summary of the best. Thank you, Ramon. It was certainly difficult for me to make a choice because there were so many good uh, abstract uh, uh, that has been shown during this Congress. Uh, I will start from a study that stemmed from uh, a negative trial, the negative trial of Sintuzumab on patients with NASH and advanced fibrosis, so uh, bridging fibrosis, uh, the, the first trial, and the second trial is Sintuzumab in patient with NASH related uh, cirrhosis. Now, this trial failed, but we have uh, a lot of information about the natural history of these patients uh, with advanced liver disease for uh, up to four years. So, what they observed, and this is something that Arun Sanyal showed uh, at the general opening session. Uh, is that after a median of 25 months, 21% with the, uh, of the patient with bridging fibrosis progressed to cirrhosis in just two years. So uh, NASH is not a benign disease. NASH is a disease that can progress uh, quite quickly. And um, what was associated with this progression? Um, it was a ISHAC stage 4, so the extent of fibrosis, the extent of hepatic collagen deposition, and also the health test. What about uh, the other features uh, of uh, uh, histological damage? Severe ballooning increased two times, uh, no, up to seven times, sorry, the risk of progression to cirrhosis. So um, we must say that uh, um, Bridging, uh, I mean, fibrosis uh, and also uh, severe ballooning should be uh, targets for the new upcoming therapy of uh, NASH. Then, what about the, the group of patients with cirrhosis? Uh, um, after a median, again, of almost two years, 19% of the patients with, cirrhotic, with cirrhosis, which was a, a well compensated cirrhosis experience clinical events, ascites, encephalopathy, variceal hemorrhage, and so on. And again, the main determinant of the progression uh, uh, to decompensation was the extent of hepatic collagen deposition uh, in the uh, baseline liver biopsy and the health test. Why, in this case, changes in NAS score were not significant. Another Another lesson that we can learn from this cohort uh, is the spontaneous weight loss that you can achieve in patients with severe uh, NASH. In uh, up to one year, only 8% of these patients were able to lose more than 5% of their initial body weight. So this is something that is really tough to be achieved spontaneously because we shouldn't forget that this trial was not designed to change lifestyle uh, uh, of these patients. So the patients who are not followed were just given some advice. But if you give some advice to these patients, uh, just 8% of them um, can wait uh, a significant, uh, can lose a significant uh, amount uh, of their weight. If you compare with the only lifestyle change study uh, the, with the histological endpoint, the Villar Gomez one, uh, there, 30% of the patient uh, um, guided by dietitians, uh, physicians, and so on, were able to lose more than 5% of their initial body weight. Of course, in this this uh, uh, the the most severe patient, but uh, from the uh, pathological, but also from the metabolic point of view, because these are diabetes, diabetics, uh, they have cardiovascular disease, and so on. And maybe in this particular cohort of patients, we might consider 
bariatric surgery. We might consider bariatric surgery because uh, it has been shown that uh, it gives up to 80% of resolution of NASH after years from the, from the uh, surgery. Then another interesting uh, natural history paper comes from Italy and uh, it's a cooperation between the University of Modena and Bologna. They followed uh, um, patients transplanted between 2000 and 2005 uh, for 10 years uh, and they were looking at the novo non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, and the novo NASH. These were mostly viral hepatitis, so patients transplanted for HBV and HCV related cirrhosis uh, and um, 20%, 22% of them developed the novo NAFLD, 5% developed the novo NASH. All of them, both of them were associated uh, with uh, um, a de novo um, uh, development of a metabolic syndrome. What was the impact? The clinical impact was that uh, those with the novo NAFLD showed a higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease and extrahepatic solid cancer. And the presence of NASH was linked, was associated with a long-term five-fold higher risk of death. So we should not just look at our NASH patient, but also to NASHize in those patients that we believe we have cured. Now, another couple of hints uh, uh, for the non-invasive liver test. Uh, serum uh, type 3 collagen propeptide or serum pro C3 is a very interesting marker, non-invasive biomarker of fibrosis, probably one of the most promising. It was tested uh, by the group of Jacob George from Sydney in cooperation with Nordic Bioscience uh, in a cohort of 150 patients and compared with, w w with the index uh, that are now available uh, to evaluate uh, uh, severe fibrosis in NAFLD patients, that is uh, the APRI, the FIB4, and the NAFLD fibrosis score. The APRI didn't perform well at all, while the AUROC for the FIB4 was 0.80, uh, for the NAFLD fibrosis score was 0.82, but uh, they developed uh, um, an algorithm uh, including the pro C3 level, the waste to weep ratio, the platelet count, the presence of diabetes, and this uh, algorithm that they call the PROSI 3 fib score had an AUROC of 0.91 and was able to correctly classify the 82% of patients uh, using the higher cutoff value. So something that definitely needs to be considered. Another important achievement is the so-called liquid biopsy, something that uh, we would love to have. Uh, it is a, a metabolic approach uh, that comes from the group uh, of Jose Mato in cooperation uh, uh, with our center in Spain and also United States. They did uh, uh, metabolomics uh, on an initial cohort of more than 600 patients uh, and validated the results in independent cohort of more than 100 patients. And the aims were to differentiate NAFLD from normal liver controls, to distinguish between simple fatty liver and NASH, and to assess fibrosis. I must say that uh, they were good uh, in all these uh, tasks. Uh, the most impressive result uh, is the ability to distinguish between simple fatty liver and NASH. That is something that none of the current non-invasive tests can achieve. CK18 uh, was a promising test, but uh, um, it revealed infected because uh, of the wide range uh, of, the, um, of the levels. So uh, they were able to distinguish uh, fatty, simple fatty liver uh, from NASH with an AUROC of 0.95 in the test population and 0.91 in the validation population, which is a, a very, very promising result. And again, uh, talking about non-invasive biomarker, um, there is a study that shows how multiparametric magnetic resonance elastography, MRE, can also be used to predict NAS score for the diagnosis of NASH. Again, something that should be achieved and because we still do not have. 
So they develop a multi-parametric MRE protocol, they call the pathogram, for the detection of the NAFLD activity score components uh, using the mechanical pro properties that detect early parenchymal viscoelastic changes uh, in NASH. They validated it in animal model and uh, in uh, human uh, NASH compared to healthy volunteers. And uh, they were able actually to distinguish each of the component of the NAS score. The fat fraction obtained from MRI PDFF best correlated with steatosis. The damping ratio correlated with lower inflammation and the complex shear modulus magnitude correlated with hepatocellular ballooning. And uh, each NAS score had an ROC higher than 0.89. So misclassification uh, was uh, obtained, occurred only in three of 51 human subjects, which is a, a great result. Talking about the novel uh, therapies, upcoming therapies uh, for NASH, that is something that uh, we would like to have as soon as possible, um, I would like to highlight uh, uh, the results of, of a phase two study uh, presented by Arun Sanyala on a pegylated FGF21 BMS 986036 in patient with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Um, FGF21 is a key regulator of metabolism. In preclinical model, it was able to improve steatosis, inflammation, hepatocyte ballooning. In this study, they randomized 74 patients to either uh, 10 mg of the compound daily or 20 mg to a pegylated compound weekly or a placebo for 16 weeks. And the primary efficacy endpoint was the change in steatosis uh, detected by MRI PDFF at week uh, 16, and then there were other exploratory endpoints. Well, after only 16 weeks, this compound was able to significantly decrease steatosis uh, both in both treatment arms, uh, uh, either the 10 mg daily or the 20 mg weekly. On top of that, uh, it was able to improve uh, uh, PROC3 MR uh, elastography, which is a measure uh, of liver stiffness, uh, deponective, uh, and liver function test. So uh, we would say that this is the really a promising uh, drug for, for the treatment uh, of NASH, also because there were just mild uh, uh, side effect like diarrhea and nausea, but none of the patients discontinued the trial. And then there is another uh, last trial, uh, there are many of them actually, but this is the last one that I selected, uh, Salonsertib, which is an, an inhibitor of ASC1, which is uh, um, a kinase that promotes hepatic uh, uh, inflammation and fibrosis in the setting uh, uh, of oxidative stress. Uh, by activation uh, of P38. Salonsertib is an inhibitor of ASC1. Um, again, they use the same patient uh, of the two trials of Sintuzumab as controls, uh, and they overlapped, uh, superimposed uh, uh, Salonsertib on Sintuzumab, and they got promising results after 12, 12 four weeks uh, of treatment. Uh, um, as uh, a reduction of uh, CK18, uh, uh, a reduction of steatosis, uh, and um, an improvement, a non significant improvement uh, in fibrosis and uh, inflammation. So, this so, is. Thank you, Elisabetta. Uh, you, you mentioned during your presentation that uh, spontaneously only 5-8% of people are able to really decrease significantly the, um, the weight. I wonder whether the ESL and ASLD, the major liver conferences, should attract more nutritionists, counselors for better diet and lifestyle, because the hepatology of the NIC this century that we are facing now is a self-inflicted disease with NAFLD and alcohol. We have good drugs to treat hepatitis C and B, but uh, obesity and alcoholism uh, cannot be treated with a single pill. What do you think about that? 
I think it is a great idea, and in fact, uh, NAFLD per se, it's not just a liver disease, uh, it's a multi-systemic disease, and uh, what it is most important to tackle this kind of disease is cooperation between different uh, uh, specialties, uh, diabetologists, uh, cardiologists, uh, uh, dietitians. Uh, we should make much more interactive uh, our uh, liver meeting uh, to find out how do they treat this patient uh, and have a complete picture of uh, the patient itself. Okay, so now is the time uh, to discuss the alcoholic liver disease uh, highlighted uh, presentations. As a, as a summary, I would say the alcoholic liver disease uh, it causes 50% of cirrhosis worldwide. And the more a country drinks, the more mortality related to the liver there is. So. We only receive 4% of the attention of the liver meetings, but it's no question that it's a major li advanced liver disease. There are very few studies in early detection. Typically, these patients are seen when they develop jaundice or decompensations. But also, there are few studies in alcoholism in these in this particular patients. Most of the attention is focused in alcoholic hepatitis, the most severe syndrome. And we have been stuck with uh, prenicillin for more than 40 years, and now that we have some promising results, some uh, some common drugs that I will that I will show you right now. The first uh, hi, uh, abstract that I want to highlight is a uh, is the Gladys study. It's a collaborative study by 16 central centers worldwide in the six continents. It's a real world study in which uh, we study 100 consecutive patients with early compensated silent liver disease versus 100 admitted patients due to liver decompensations in, in uh, GI and liver centers. Across the world, in all the world, we realize that early patients mostly have hepatitis C, 30%, hepatitis B, 20%, NAFLD, roughly 20%, but only 2% of the early patients were alcoholics. So alcoholics are not detected early worldwide. But when we go to the admitted patients, we see the opposite. That 30, almost 35% of the patients across the world admitted due to liver decompensations were alcoholics. When we do the ratio, it's incredible. Every 12 patients with advanced liver disease due to alcohol, one only with early liver disease is seen. While in all the other diseases, they are seen a little more early than advanced. So this study clearly shows that there is an urgent need to start campaigns for early detection of alcoholic disease, alcoholic liver disease worldwide. That is a real, real need in our field. Let's go to some um, of the new therapies for alcoholic hepatitis. As you know, it's a syndrome characterized by jaundice and rapid decompensations in heavy alcoholics. They have a high uh, short-term mortality rate, up to 30, 40% at three months. So there is some of the, some new drugs that they are very promising. Uh, recent data shows that it's not all about intrahepatic inflammation, but rather an impaired regeneration of the liver. The parasite is unable to regenerate. There's a, a massive ductular reaction that is inefficient to uh, provide new hepatocytes, and the liver function fails. One of the therapies that were proposed is the use granul granulocyte colony stimulating factor, or GCSF. There was one previous study from India, now uh, uh, one of the most active uh, um, liver groups in the world from Dr. Serene in India, in New Delhi, they also did a new trial in non-responders to corticosteroids who were randomized to receive GCSF or placebo. And the results were encouraging. The number of patients is not very high, but the results were very spectacular in which granulocyte uh, colony stimulating factor decreased mortality in these patients. This uh, raised uh, the issue that not only anti-inflammatory drugs, but also drugs promoting liver re regeneration could be useful in this condition. Uh, let's go to another study in alcoholic hepatitis. We'll see patients with alcoholic hepatitis very sick at admission. When they overcome the admission and they survive the first days, they go home, some of them recover the disease and they compensate, what we call recompensation of the liver, and they improve the liver function, and they don't need a liver transplant. While other patients, despite the abstinence, they never recover the liver function to normal levels. They remain decompensated and they will need a liver transplant. There are not very many studies predicting which patients will reverse, which other patients are more less likely to reverse the liver disease. In a very, very good study from the group, um, an Emporian College for Steve uh, Atkinson and Mike First, they are doing a 
several ancillary studies of the STOPA trial. The STOPA trial was a recently published trial in the New England Journal of Medicine that treated more than 1,200 patients with alcoholic hepatitis with different regimes, and they showed that prednisolone is useful only to increase survival in one month while pentoxifaline was ineffective. One of the ancillary studies that they have done in this disease is selecting patients that overcame the, uh, the episode of alcoholic hepatitis and see which are the predictors of recovery of the liver function. They found two. One genetic, that's the PNLP3 or the nutrient polymorphism. You know that this polymorphism predisposes alcoholics and people with metabolic syndrome to develop cirrhosis due to NAFLD or ALD. But in this study, they showed that this polymorphism also influences that you won't recover to a normal function. Uh, there are more and more studies in PNLP3 in alcoholic hepatitis, and m very soon probably we will genotype all these patients in the clinical practice. The other thing they, they found is an, is an obvious, obvious finding that patients that regain the alcohol, they relapse alcohol in the first three months, they go back to drinking, they're less likely to recover, as you can imagine. Highlighting that these patients are in a high list of relapse despite this life event that represents an alcoholic hepatitis and hospitalization, and they need therapy. They need to be seen by a counselor. We have to be more active in treating alcoholism in these patients. Let's go to another study in a big cohort of another leading group in the world, in the Lille group from Alexander Lovet, Philippe Matouin, et al. They have been probably the most active group in the world doing clinical trials in alcoholic hepatitis. And using those cohorts that they have treated for many years, they have followed them up for many years. And they have seen which are the determinants of mortality in the long term. What they found, they, they uh, studied more than 400 patients follow up for several years that in the first six months after an episode of alcoholic hepatitis, the mortality is, is, uh, is influenced and is, is, uh, can be um, um, uh, estimated by the degree of the liver failure. How severe was the, uh, was the episode? The more severe the episode is, the more likely you will die in the next six months. But beyond the six months, the main determinant of survival is alcoholism. Beyond six months, those patients who re re regain alcoholism and they relapse alcohol are more likely to don't recover and to have high mortality rate. We have to uh, highlight that this study, we did a similar study in Barcelona with a very similar result, results. And also we know that the STOPA trial have done a follow-up study with also similar results. In all of these three studies, I have to say that bef between 35 and 50% of the patients will relapse alcohol. So having an alcoholic hepatitis uh, uh, is a life event that probably up to 50% of the patients stop drinking, but it's still half of our population go back to drinking. We need uh, clinical trials to treat alcoholism in this population. There are no clinical trials in this population so far in motivational interviewing or anti drugs, and this is, a, again, an urgent need in our field. These are all the four abstracts that I want to highlight uh, from this, um, this uh, field in this ALC 2017. We still need much more research in this field for sure. It's the most overlooked and ignored field in hepatology. And we'll have to face this field in the next years, given that the hepatitis B and C are so successfully treated with the current drugs. So very interesting results. Uh, um, Am I asking, in your clinical practice, would you stratify patients according to their genetic background? This is a very interesting question. I say, say there are more and more evidence showing that PNA, PNA, PNA3 polymorphism influences mortality in alcoholic hepatitis. We just accepted a paper from the same group from the uh, Imperial College in, in Journal of Hepatology. It now affects recovery and affects the development of uh, cirrhosis in heavy alcoholics. So probably in the near future, and it happens with interleukin 28, where the hepatitis C therapy will interfere, we'll start uh, genotyping the patients with alcoholism with this genotype, because pretty much influences the natural history of this disease. And do you think that uh, uh, telling the patient that he has several risk factors for liver-related disease, if he drinks uh, more than he should, uh, would help the patient uh, to uh, withdraw yeah. from yeah. alcohol? Uh, uh, I don't use. I think it's a very interesting question, how we can motivate the patients and raise awareness of the patient. You're at a high risk to develop cirrhosis. I, th I think everything can help. And telling the patients you have a 
genotype, your genes that your parents complain to you, give you a higher risk to develop cirrhosis complications, can be can motivate the person to the patient to stop drinking. Uh, we, we should use all the possible tools, and this could be one. Thank you so much, and don't forget to go to uh, Libertree if you want more information for these abstracts and presentations. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Elisabetta. Thank you.